Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure we should say thank you very much. Because <laughs> I mean, you should be in my shoes right now. Um, I um, feel like uh, I'm at a buffet as I listen to these papers, one after the other. And uh, every paper sounds terrific. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I go to a buffet, I always make sure my wife goes in front of me in the line because I can t rely upon her to make an intelligent choice. <laughs> because if I go first, I'll just take everything. And that's, you know, then the, the beef gravy will be running into the salmon and it'll be a, it'll be a mess. And that's a little bit the way I, uh, way I feel right now. Um, so, so what, I, what I want to do here is, uh, I'm going to try to sort out where we've got agreement and what we're debating, as, as best I can. Uh, I don't actually have a, a, a dog in this race, and, uh, but I, I, I have half, a, half of an idea of what I, what I think. Uh, so I'll throw that out, but it's, I don't mean it to be the fifth paper. We already have four. I don't, so I'm not, I don't propose this is the fifth paper. And then at the end, I'm going to throw out four ideas, which I don't intend to be grenades to, grenades to blow things up, but just uh, some complications that I'd like to put on the floor to uh, make things even worse <laughs> than they already are. Um, I, I really do have a, a great deal of sympathy for, for the whole thing, for what, what, what each of us in, in various ways has been doing. Uh, it's an uh, attempt to, to sort of dodge the bullet of, of a materialistic uh, reductionism and to give the world um, a depth dimension or uh, an ulteriority or an interiority. And so, I, um, I, it's, it's congenial to me. The whole, the whole project is, con is, is congenial to me. Here's what I think everybody agrees about. <laughs> this, will, this will be an instant eruption of disagreement. <laughs> I, I, I take it that the common assumptions, that there are three common assumptions, that, that everybody here is trying to take the natural sciences as seriously as possible. Uh, as Phil put it, to, Phil put it to, to go with it as far as you possibly can, without re resorting to, first, syncretism, which would just be a kind of easy blending of religion and science, um, or supernaturalism, which, is, which holds that while God is the author of the world, when if things get serious, God feels called upon to intervene and to make sure that God gets what he's really after. So he has to give it a kind of supernatural booster shot. And finally, we're trying to avoid turning our own experience into uh, an epiphenomenon, into something unreal. So we want to take our own, uh, we want to take science very seriously. And we want to take our own experience very seriously. And we want to say, there's something out there that's eating at us that we can't quite put our finger on. Now, I, I think, <laughs> I'm afraid to look at them. <laughs> I, I think we agree with that. What, what people have been arguing about, I have sat, sat here silently listening to the arguments, even at lunch, I, I tried to stay out of it until the very end, until I, I couldn't resist it anymore, and, and listen. Here's, here are some of the arguments that are going on. First of all, there's an, an ancient argument about whether the scene is the, can, be, can, be, can give birth to the different or whether the same always comes from the same. So, is consciousness of such a sort that it must come from consciousness? 
Is consciousness so different from matter that it can't come from matter? There must, it must be consciousness all, all the way down. Or is it the very nature of change that the same comes from the different? That you wouldn't have change, you wouldn't have motion, you wouldn't have things altering unless something became different. It's not the same all the way down. Secondly, we've been arguing about the notion of combination. Okay. Do, do, does this change take place by, by moving from symbols that get added up into more complex entities? Or is that too simple? Thirdly, should we, instead of thinking in terms of combinations, should we think in terms of a movement from implicit to explicit? So motion is not the complication of, of simple things. The complexity is not complexification. It's explicitation. It's moving from the implicit to the explicit. It's moving from potency to act. Yes. It's not. It's not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> We've been arguing about whether we should think top down. Or bottom up, or both. Do, do, do holes constitute themselves uh, out of uh, lower elements and build up higher ones? Or do the higher ones monitor the lower elements and organize them? Or could it actually work both ways? Could you have both those processes going on at the same time? We've been having an argument in, in what's called, what the logicians call, or the analytic process called mirology, the, the, the logic of parts and wholes. What happens, what's the relationship between a part and a whole? Can, can parts, when they enter into a whole, acquire new features, new properties? Or are they still the summation of the parts? Are the properties of the parts still uh, visible and detectable and identifiable in the whole? Or does something uh, transformative take place when the part becomes a part of a whole? And finally, it's not, not finally, but it's the, last thing, it's the last thing on my list that I can find. You should see my notes over there. Does the whole thing have a point? Does it have a omega? Does it have a telos? Is it going somewhere? Is it tending towards unity? Is it becoming whole, becoming one, becoming actual? Or maybe not. Maybe it's just happening. You didn't actually explore that very much, but that's, that's one of the points I want to bring up. Now, as I said, I don't have a a, a dog in this race. I don't, I don't do the scientific, I, I don't do the philosophy of science in, in a sufficiently fine-grained way to, to, to defend an opinion in uh, any detailed way. But I, nonetheless, I, I mean, I, I would say myself, um, as a postmodern philosopher, I, I, I greet the idea of panpsychism with a certain amount of what Leotard called incredulity. And I think that's a perfect word. It's an exquisite word. He's not saying it's wrong. He's not saying it's false. He just says, I don't, I just don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and that's, that's his attitude towards metaphysics generally. Oh. Big meta theories like that. He says, he, he greets them with a yawn. He just don't believe it. And that's about how I feel like this, about being a psychist. I just, maybe, you know, that's when, when the history of science is a history of people doing things, which, which everybody else said, I don't believe that. Tycho Brahe couldn't believe that the earth was moving. When somebody says the earth is revolving around the sun, you know, if they said that 600 years ago, um, you say, what? This is crazy. So maybe something crazy is true. I mean, that, that, 
That's possible. Yeah. I know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it strikes. It just hits me that way. It just strikes me that way. It, it seems much, much more sensible to me that something like what we're calling emergence is the case. That that very simple things uh, take on new properties when they become uh, holes, when they, when they enter into larger, larger things. And that this is, a, this is a process that builds up to a point where something, something happens which nobody can explain. And that is why at a certain point, we become, we consciousness. Five hundred years ago, there were all, we don't know the answer to that. A hundred years ago, there were all kinds of things we didn't know the answer to. Five hundred years from the uh, uh, fact, there were way more things that we couldn't answer. So I can see that in the next hundred years, if we don't destroy the planet first, somebody is going to come up with something. Some guy with, or person or woman with a PhD who can't get a job <laughs> working could be anyone in the city. <laughs> working in a patent office, maybe, <laughs> will publish an article that will turn the whole world upside down. I, I could see that happen. <laughs> and, and we'll have a certain account of what's, what right now seems like another mystery. I don't, maybe, so maybe there'll be what the literature calls a Darwin of consciousness. But we, here at Villanova, would supplement that with a Mendel, a Gregor Mendel of consciousness. Next week, we're going to give an award to uh, Gregor Mendel, to a uh, distinguished scientist who also has a religious uh, orientation. We honor that, we, we name it after Gregor Mendel. The very first awardee was Teilhard de Chardin. So, all right, so that's what, that, that's sort of the, the layout of the problem. Now let me, how much, what do I have now? How much time do I have? Maybe four minutes. Four minutes. Oh, Five? <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> let, me, let me just throw out four, four fast ideas. Four fast ideas. Again, these are not, not these are questions, concerns, lamentations, uh, Observations. <laughs> First thing is, what's make, one thing that's making me nervous in these discussions is the use of the word consciousness. I, I think that consciousness is something that, in the history of, of phenomenology, has been very thoroughly displaced. Heidegger said, Erkennen, pure knowing, is a founded mode of being in the world. That is to say, we don't go about, we, we are not engaged in pure knowing, we are concretely engaged with the world. We, we, we do things. Erkennen, knowing, consciousness, just being aware. This was his critique of Husserl. We don't just look at things. We don't just see colors, which is a very paradigmatic expression in, or example in this literature. We are actively engaged with things that have colors. So it's the notion of consciousness seems to be thin, abstract, misleading, and maybe even something of a distortion of what Heidegger calls being in the world, what Wittgenstein called a form of life, what Husserl called a, a, a Lebensfeld, a, a, a life world. And Merleau Ponty, who we heard from in Ilya's paper, said this is also, uh, um, it is also a, a deeply, thoroughly, utterly bodily uh, activity. And so the distinction between mind and, uh, the, 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 there, isn't any, any, there isn't any mind matter distinction if you just describe your experience which is what we would learn from phenomenology. Second thing, uh, so that's in phenomenology. Second thing from Paul Tillich, whom uh, they also referred to. Tillich thinks about God as the ground of being. And he shocked the orthodox when he said this, because he said, God is not Captain Marvel. God is not a super being. God is the depth of being. God is the ground of being. And the, one of the objections that came to him out of the orthodox were, well, well, then who are we praying to? When we pray, we pray to somebody. We can't pray to the ground, the being. And Tillich's answer is, 
He says, the, the personal is, is, is a manifestation of the ground of being. The ground of being is not a person. It is the ground of persons. It is not less than personal or impersonal, but it is the ground of persons. So persons e are emergent, I would say, for Tilling, as manifestations of the depths of things. So, there's a so I'm concerned about the religious use of the word, word uh, God here. And I, and I do think that we don't have to say that God is personal to preserve what is elemental in religion. And I, I, I think, and, and he says, it emerges from the powers of being. What are the powers of being? They are not just light and unity and love and, and, and it's all wonderful. They are both light and dark. So that when God emerges into the world, all hell breaks loose. Because in God, the dark powers are in check. But when individuals who are not God emerge from the ground, then there's strife, unrest, discontent. The demonic face of God emerges. Which is an interesting answer to the problem of evil. Um, finally, well, I was going to say something else, but finally, if we are going to take science seriously, not, none of you has raised the question um, about what is a pretty well-received theory right now, that the universe is headed for entropic oblivion. That is to say, if we went back to this thing that we had up here about the history of the universe, keep going! Keep, keep going into numbers that are, you know, you, they have to make up words for the size, the magnitude of the numbers. And, until you're in trillions of trillions and trillions and trillions of years. Hence. And the universe, according to a well-received theory, will expand into oblivion. No more love, no more consciousness, no more mind, no more being in the world, no more truth, no more unity. It's not, it's not heading towards unity, it's heading, the omega stands for oblivion. Now, I'm not responsible for that theory. <laughs> I, I get too modest. I get, a kick, I get a kick out of reporting it, but I know. So, so my last point is, well, what about that? <laughs> what, what, what does that do? Okay, that's, that's all I got. <laughs> provocative insights. Uh, I, I'm going to hold back on my comments <laughs> and response, and I'm going to open it up and ask each speaker maybe just to give maybe five minutes or so of what you've heard uh, from Jack, and if you'd like to respond uh, in some way. So beginning with Phil, and then to Steve and uh, Tim. As always, I loved it. And it, um, it leaves us with a question, just say, to hell with it, it's just not going to work, and try to do entertaining talks, each one on her or his own, or to see if we can address your questions and address each other. Mm -hmm. That's the question I came into the conference with, and it feels more urgent now, having heard us all speak, so, mostly urgent with... Phil, can you use the mic? Oh yeah, you can. Hear me, I, I normally just get louder and louder, but um, okay, I can do that. Uh, actually, it's not trillions and trillions, it's 40 billion and a complete heat death of the universe by 70 billion where everything is um, a few degrees above absolute zero and nothing occurs. So well, it's, it's closer than you thought, just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> According to the, to the death from the skies, it's not nearly that close. It's, it's way, way All right, well, we should fight about that. Um, I'll, I'll bet you. I, I once brought that book on an airplane, by the way, Death from the Skies. That's really depressing. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> So if that's true that we don't just want to do the solo languages, then what if the cr uh, criterion is bridge building? What if the criterion is can we engage in dialogue with the other? And what if your criterion for evaluating my talk or any of the others is does it allow that sort of connection? Well, for example, if it refuses to allow connections to be drawn across disciplines, and we are from different disciplines, then we're stuck. We failed to get anywhere except how entertaining was an individual talk, and Jack obviously wins that one. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, but there's, this is actually a criterion that can take us somewhere. For example, if we go all the way to the unity, which some people that you read would do, you can't build bridges because you're all on the same continent. You can't separate out and you're stuck. So we're stuck in incomprehensible descriptions, incommensurable descriptions of the one, right? If we're locked into a single disciplinary language, we're stuck. So what if that criterion would be that I speak and say Ilya speaks in a way that you can, and that we both seek to draw out the connections between different vocabularies so that you can see them. Now it may be that we can't decide where, let's say we hold different positions, complementary positions on four or five issues. You can't decide which is right. I think mine is, or I'm more convinced that she's right. But at least we've shown for you what the connections would look like. To me, that would be a criterion of success. I could spell out more, but um, let me just stop there and come to a last thought. I worry that, that even if we can draw connections, make clear relations, we can't resolve issues. And let me just mention three and I'm done. The first reason I fear is that we must use ourselves as the plumb line as a measure. And we can't use ourselves as the plumb line as a measure. Pascal once said that here we are caught between two infinities, the infinitely small and the infinitely large, and we're in the space in between. So in biology, I can't help but think about the cell by taking what we are as beings and then try to take away complexity of brain and so forth until I get to cell functioning. I can't think of God except in light of what we know and the metaphors of the two lovers as philia, as friends, and the personal um, metaphors, beautifully physical metaphors um, used by St. Angela. So I can't get to God and I can't get to the smaller, but if I'm trying to know where we fit in a universe, I'm stuck, right? Because I can't project and I can't not project. So that's one reason why I'm worried. And the second one is you had evidence over the last four talks of the incommensurability of positions. So my second reason for worry is that we're in an age of unrestrained, unrestrained pluralism. We're in a, an age of multiplying positions with, it appears, no connections between them, no way of evaluating. And that's the reason for skepticism. And my last reason, is a reason both for skepticism and optimism, and I think of that as the interior dimension. It separates in one way, but it allows intuitive connections between subjectivities that, could, that are really attractive. It allows for real connection, even if I can't tell you conceptually how it was connected. Indeed, it allows for a sense of something interconnected Wordsworth says, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused. And possibly even, it allows for that deepest connection with the ground of being, as you described it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Phil. That was really very insightful. I just have one line in the hand over to Steve. As you were talking, I couldn't help but think, uh, if we do that, so this idea that, you know, we are, in a sense, hyper-specialized, right? You know, in a sense, we reduce everything to our own language and methodologies. Um, I wonder if what we need here is a new epistemology, which what I might call a, a, phenom a phenomenology of embrace. In other words, embracing the position in the, midst of its own, in the midst of the questions without trying to reduce the questions to some kind of either or um, you know, answer. And I think we don't do well with ambiguity. And that is, in a sense, our, our biggest <laughs> faux pas epistemologically. Yeah. Steve? OK. Um, let's see, is this on? I don't think so. Uh, Pick it up and I think it will be. That's sure. Hello? No? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, well, first of all, um, I want to thank Jack for his comments. Um, and I actually don't take quite as much uh, offense, if I may put it, that Phil did. <laughs> um, I, I, I would say the following. Uh, first of all, I actually thought Jack did bring out kind of the issues that we were all kind of raising in common. So I, I think there's a sense in which we can overplay the incommensurability that was going on here. 
and I think the most charitable way to look at these talks uh, is as kind of offering uh, different kinds of roadmaps for putting together a wide variety of disciplines that indeed are not normally in that much conversation with each other, especially if we're talking about the scientific and theological side of things. Right? There's not exactly a lot of benchmarks for how you put it together, and let alone what counts as success or failure in doing so. Okay? Because there is a sense, and, and here Phil I think is right, that even when science and theology are addressing uh, questions that verbally sound the same, uh, the criteria of success and the kinds of things one needs to include for an adequate answer and all this kind of stuff right, aren't the same. And so there's always going to be a tendency for those of us who do want to build bridges to come up with some hybrid thing, right, which in a way satisfies no one, right, but kind of excites people. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? And there's a sense in which if we have more of that going on, so it's not just these four papers, and it's not you know, thinking about this conference as kind of an outlier, but rather there's something that could be going on on a regular basis, there would be more exemplars for this. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, uh, Jack was, uh, uh, you know, citing Leotard and saying uh, that, you know, that he is incredulous about uh, panpsychism. Fair enough. I, I think that is, you know, uh, but he's, he also said in the next breath about how, in fact, our, our fundamental scientific theories can change over time, okay? And one of the ways in which they do change over time is not because we get new data, but we do get kind of new formulations, new ways of looking at things, right? And so I'm, I'd be the first one to agree with Jack that, as it were, uh, neither the scientific nor the theological community is particularly well disposed to a kind of panpsychist perspective. And this is one of the reasons why when I try to, you know, when I'm presenting it in what I regard as a very full-blooded kind of way, I actually have to go back to the late 19th century when a lot of these issues were much more alive and a lot of, a lot of the issues that were alive back then weren't closed down the way they are to a large extent. And this suggests to me something about the role that history can play. Um, uh, because I do think um, there is sometimes an unfortunate tendency, especially within analytic philosophy, much more so than continental philosophy, um, for, as it were, the first line philosophers, the first order philosophers and the historians of philosophy to be kind of at loggerheads with each other, right? And there's a sense in which if one talks, if one, is, if, if one thinks of oneself as a first order philosopher, let's say, but brings in a lot of historical stuff and gives a kind of historical framing to things, especially to motivate philosophical debates today, uh, that seems too often as beside the point, when in fact that seems to be quite necessary because otherwise, and I think we, you know, we see this all the time, I think, in philosophy, where positions and arguments get presented in a very stereotypically scholastic manner, where it's often very difficult to figure out why would anyone say such a thing, right? This is true of almost every position in philosophy, which is one of the reasons why, especially in analytic philosophy, you know, it's pretty much a mug's game, right? No position ever wins, right? None of them ever seem adequately motivated. But of course, they all have histories. And the histories are tied together with lots of stuff about how these views are supposed to connect up to other more substantive things that are going on in the world. And we need to kind of recover some of that. That's a, another aspect that will actually make a lot of this sort of discussion more relevant and much richer, and I think much richer not only to the professionals, the academic professionals, but also to the larger public. Right? Because one of the things about monism was it was a popular movement. Right? There was a monist league, for example, right? I mean, in the late 19th century. Right? They, they were kind of like reading groups and fan clubs and things like that. Okay? You can't imagine that neutral monism would stir much emotion today. Okay? But it did back then. All right? uh, and, and so I do think we need to you know, bear all this in, in mind, but I'm, you know, generally speaking, optimistic as long as we have follow-ups to this kind of event and people get used to looking at things in this kind of broader, cross-disciplinary way, especially one where the metaphysics is something in play. Right? The metaphysics, I mean, I think this is one thing that's very distinctive, and again, it's something you don't see so often, is the explicit discussion of what is an appropriate metaphysical framework within which to put all these disciplines in play with each other. And so I would encourage all of that as something to go forward in the future. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sure. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to start off... Um, uh, so I'm trying to focus in on uh, some of the things that Jack had to say. Um, so first, uh, methodology. Um, it occurs to me, um, we, we, to make progress, we always, at any stage of, of development in any sphere of inquiry, we have, to, we have to have some kind of tangible 
specific concrete models of what we're trying to explain to work with. We know, if we're at all you know, sensitive to the reality, that these are overly simplistic models. Right? But, but so, so we make them as sophisticated as we can, uh, incorporating as much of the data that we have. Um, and, and we try to improve them. Um, and that's just the way progress is very incremental. So I, I am very much inspired by the kind of the mature sciences in terms of having this kind of humble, you do the best you can, you chip away, you make things, you, you build your models, you refine them, you, and you wait for new ideas that, that can be produce revolutionary changes in your thinking. That happens very infrequently. Um, so, okay, consciousness. Um, True, there's, there is a kind of uh, abstraction when we think about the phenomena of consciousness um, that because conscious states occur within living, active beings. That was one of the themes you were wanting to emphasize. And so there is a kind of oversimplification to suggest that it's this kind of you know, separated phenomena that can be completely divorced from the being in, who is conscious, who does, who acts, who always has goals and purposes. Uh, I think that's true, but we still can isolate the phenomena to a degree and say, you know, just like biologically, um, scientists uh, who study the you know, living organisms can isolate certain subsystems. Um, there's an, uh, an artificiality to a degree when you do that, but you, you gain a lot of illumination when you do that by, by focusing in. So uh, I do think there is a reality of consciousness that we can talk about, we can begin to try to um, ask, um, and there, there are some scientists who are starting to ask questions about um, well, what are, just when we take consciousness seriously, what are the generic characteristics that conscious states have that puzzles, like, puzzle us? So there's a, a, a theorist, Tononi, who I think is a kind of broadly physicalist, but he takes consciousness seriously, and he, he tries to figure out, okay, these are the characteristics that we ascribe to consciousness. It's a kind of artificial simplification, but he's, 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 it's like a first pass. I think of it as a trying to get a scientific hold, an explanatory hold on what we're trying to talk about. He, he certainly does not have the last word uh, on the subject matter, but it's a start. Uh, and and that, that's the way I, I think often you have to go at it. So I think even, you know, I, I bandied about notions of emergence, and I think it emerged that there are different notions of emergence. Uh, but here, too, there's a kind of artificiality when you talk about top-down, right? It can sound very crude and primitive. You know, you got all this stuff interacting, and then boom, you got your top-down elements occasionally coming in. We know it's not like that. Uh, I think we, we know if there really, if there, if there really are top-down uh, causal influences within living organisms uh, or other kind of complex systems. It's also, there's robust bottom-up. Bottom um, uh, structuring going on and how these two interplay is we don't we, we're not in a position to know you have to know enough on both sides of the equation before you can even begin to give realistic models so now we're just giving toy models we're just talking in very abstract terms but that's you know that's a small step towards as more data comes in a richer understanding of the underlying substructure and, and maybe a better theory of the, the, the top-down you know, that, that these will have better models that will replace the crude models that we have. Um, uh, the, only, the other thing I want to talk about was the place of God in our scheme of things that Jack uh, brought in. It's kind of God was, is the, uh, the ghost at the banquet here a little bit. Um, uh, he's kind of been lurking about, but well, it came out certainly in Ilya's talk was, was very centrally, but in some of the, uh, our other talks was a little bit there in the shadows, but not, not really fully ex explicit, and Jack wanted to uh, kind of smoke us out on that. Um, and he, he announced that happily we have some agreements, but I, I, I'm not so sure. At first I thought, well, yeah, maybe. Uh, he, in one of his points, he said, we're going to take science seriously, take consciousness seriously, and not have an interventionist God. Um, and I thought, well, okay, I think I know what he means by that, and I agree, but, um, you know, there's... Uh, so what Jack meant by that, Jack means by that, I think, is God has no sort of, we shouldn't think of God as a, maybe a causal agent within reality, sustaining, uh, bringing stuff into being uh, where there was no stuff before. 
Uh, I would grant myself, I, don't, I can't follow him in that as a kind of traditional theist. Um, there is a kind of bad kind of interventionism. I, I, I think of uh, Leibniz's critique of Newton. You know, Newton mm -hmm. famously, he did the calculations and he thought, well, there's one problem in my, my sort of system of the solar system, uh, that over time it looks like the planets are going to slowly get out of whack, out of the orbits, and eventually things would, should, would just fly apart, the planets should fly apart. That, that was his calculation, that, that was likely to be true. And so in his famous Principia, you know, might be the greatest work in the history of physical science, in an appendix he says, well, God just puts your son back in from time to time. <laughs> no problem. And, and uh, you know, life just, you know, just be life, of course, Newton hated each other. They, you know, accused each other of uh, plagiarism about the calculus, all that. You know, Leibniz said this is ridiculous. This is like a watchmaker, you know, you know, um, uh, who doesn't, can't be bothered to build a good enough watch, so he's got to fix it periodically, and, you know, and we all laugh along with that, and we think that is kind of, you know, this is God of the Gaps theology kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm on board, if that's what we mean by we don't want an interventionist picture of God needing to kind of uh, do certain things to keep, the, to allow the universe to do its regular business. Um, but, you know, Leibniz also went on to say uh, God um, acts, especially acts not in order to satisfy the needs of nature, but the, the needs of grace. That is, he, he was a traditional Christian. He believed God was capable of acting miraculously. But of course, Leibniz too, he was a deeply philosophical thinker about the nature of God. And he would say, God is everywhere. He's doing everything, right? He's, he's every single little event ever taking place in the universe. God is the primary cause behind that. And if God chooses to be the primary cause in an unusual way in certain special circumstances for certain communicative purposes, or something like that, sure, he's capable of doing that. Uh, it's not as if he has a nature that renders him incapable, that the universe somehow prevents him from, from, from being uh, specially involved in, in whatever way he might please. Uh, but, you know, as we look about, uh, around us, we inhabit a dramatically regular world that has its own integrity, so clearly that's not the way God um, structures reality, right, in this kind of special interaction. Um, and uh, and you, uh, I don't know, Jack seemed to want to kind of push back at the very idea of the personhood of God. Um, I, I find that idea, I mean, that's not the only way to think about God, but I think it has deep explanatory power. Um, it can uh, potentially yield explanation why it is the universe, apparently, uh, based on, on 20th century physics, deeply fine-tuned for the emergence of life. There, there's a potential role for God's personality and, and, and wisdom and creativity to play a role in explaining why the universe should have that. I don't have time to explore the ways in which um, the universe is exquisitely fine-tuned in its deepest fundamental structure for the eventual emergence of life. Um, if God is a personal reality, he could, God could serve as a unifying ground of value in the world. You know, it's kind of a puzzle for those of us who are committed to there being objective value of moral value, epistemic value, some theories are objectively better than other theories, right? Different kinds of, the place of value in a purely physical cosmos is very mysterious, right? But if both emanate from a personal reality, right? You can have a unifying explanation. There, there are other things that a personal God can explain. Um, so, uh, and finally, it also speaks to Jack's closing, what about that? The coming heat death of the universe. Um, so uh, I, you know, I believe in emergence. I believe, uh, and I think of that as getting change from not just same same, but same different. And um, there's regularity uh, in, in the way the universe unfolds. Um, but uh, the the ultimate transition is the transition of the the the, the ages, right? And uh, so if you are a traditional religious theist, you don't think God's going to just watch the universe go into a cold heat death, and that's the end of all that. So there is going to be a disruption, a, a, a discount, dramatic discontinuity. That's, um, uh, that, 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 and, and if you don't have that, um, then you might worry about um, value in your universe. Yeah? Thanks, Jack. Well, I guess I have the last word on the four speakers. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to open up to that brief, very brief. Uh, so listening to my colleagues here, uh, I guess I just have a few remarks, and, and one is a uh, question of methodologies or methods. You know, we all come at this question of consciousness, mind and matter from very different perspectives. I think I, I would always want to, I myself, 
not be attached to methods or methodologies that um, I think the complexities of our age does call for a certain level of humility that we're able to let go and to, in a sense, engage uh, new methods when the, the right time comes. And maybe this question of mind and matter uh, is pulling us in that direction. I also think as I uh, listen to the various positions on mind and matter, uh, you know, as a former scientist, I was in neuroscience for a number of years, and so uh, it's funny, <laughs> I always have to chuckle a little bit at the value we give to science, because, um, <clears throat> but truthfully, as a scientist, as a research scientist, those of you who have been in active research know that it's a very, <laughs> it's a very, uh, um, how would I say, you're in a field of unknowing, and it's a constant searching for the known uh, principles, you know, in other words, it's a constant repetition of experiments over and over and over again until, you know, it just seems like this may be the right possible, you know, just an approximation. Science is always an approximation of the real. It's never, I think, fully like, ta-da, because every time you're asking a question and you come up with some kind of answer, it just opens up Pandora's box to a whole new set of questions, right? So there's a whole level here, and I, I wonder in our own age if we are so attuned to this scientific positivism, we have kind of lost sight that really the true path to knowledge is the in the unknowing. It's not precisely what we know, it's what we don't know. Uh, and I think, you know, at the more as we know, the more in a sense we don't know. And I think to be comfortable in the unknowingness uh, of the ever-facing, you know, um, contours of our life, and that presses us onward to keep asking the questions and to engage. And I do think, I do agree that dialogue is perhaps one of the most essential ingredients today if we are to come to uh, an understanding, not in the sense perhaps of an intellectual understanding together. We may never satisfy that understanding because of the amount of uh, information we now have at our disposal. I think we need to come to di different and newer levels of understanding together. And in this way, I think I would want to include more the role of the emotion and the ascent and the senses in the whole knowing process. Um, uh, again, what I was trying to argue before is that it's never consciousness as a, a self-contained entity of mind, right? It's always consciousness of. We're being drawn to something, whether it's a question itself or the particular study of an entity. There is a level there for what uh, Teilhard called love or attraction. What is that attractive force? That's a question for me. We haven't even addressed that, right? What is that attractive force there? Uh, and so I guess I would want to maybe warrant against the dispassionate mind uh, and call for a new level of uh, the passionate mind in the pursuit of these questions in our own time. So uh, I just want to thank you know the, the speakers here and for Jack for raising some of the issues and. Maybe at this point, I would just like to open it up to you uh, to, to, to engage your outstanding questions, concerns. We don't want to leave you with you know, the cloud of unknowing, like in the great <laughs> confusion. We'd like to leave you with some kind of insight here. So, Maynard, you can be with you. Well, since my friend Jack has uh, resurrected Professor Tillich, <laughs> let me um, let me say that I had the good fortune of studying with Professor Tillich in the last year of his life at the University of Chicago in a quarter and culminated in a second quarter seminar that was team taught by Professor Tillich and Mercy a number of years. But Professor and I Tillich, really closer, I think. Professor Tillich <laughs> famously talked about God as the ground of being. But it seems to me that's too sad of a concept and doesn't fit with what we have heard in this, um, this, this uh, session today and last night. It's much more appropriate in my mind to think with Charles Hartshorn as who said, um, God is the ground of all becoming. And if that's, if that's closer to the truth, then I think all of our talk about upward causality or downward or up, up, or downward causality is, um, is a dead end. I mean, I think, personally, I think we beat that to death. And I think it's much more appropriate if 
God is in the equation, to say neither God is neither up or down, but is up ahead of us. And if God is up ahead of us, then causality becomes a non-issue. What is what is important is that calm out of the future that comes to us and allows us to perceive our actions with significance. Otherwise, otherwise I don't see any any option for significance in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, with, with that, with that thought, uh, I would like to just ask for some reaction about such an ontological notion as God coming to us out of the future. So let me just maybe just two minutes, and I'll turn over to my colleagues here. I would add a third category to downward causation and upward uh, causality, and I would call it withinness and withoutness. In other words, uh, the beingness of being, in other words, there's an inwardness of being, so to speak, um, and a being with being, so to speak, if I can put it in this language, if you use the language of call, right? God coming to us from the future. Well, we have to be inattentive to, you know, future, in the sense there's something more. And so I think that inwardness uh, and, and again, the depth of inwardness alerts us to the, the, you know, in a sense, to something that's more than ourselves, right? The overflow of being, so to speak. So that God is then that withoutness, within and without, coming to us from the future. I mean, I, I, rather than the top down, bottom up thing. If, if reality includes the inwardness to which you refer, um, that, is, that is exactly correct. And that is beyond. What, what science can address. Well, I'll hand it over to you guys. I'll leave the outcome, but I just have to speak to the straw man position about causation. Um, in physics, we do dynamic systems, and we talk about influences in the dynamics. There's no, it's absolutely not static cause. In biology, the systems of biology, we look at influences of continually advancing systems. For process thought, God becomes one of those influences. So there's no competition between causation and change or vision. Um, so uh, thank you again, gentlemen, madam, uh, <laughs> for the talk. Um, I have two questions. The first being, I don't know how relevant it is now, I don't know how much it's been updated, but has have any of you heard of um, Rupert Sheldrake and like Morphic Resonance? Yeah. So how does that how does that play in? He's in the book you just published. Yeah, him. So, right. so you have to plead guilty, sister. <laughs> I think uh, Sheldrake's idea is that there are informational fields, you know, and so the informational field sets up like a seed. Uh, so the, the, the constant flow of that information, in a sense repeated, sets up a resonance that other entities can tap into uh, because of the entanglement, so to speak, uh, of, you know, reality. And so, you know, they can tap into the resonance. The resonance is like a seed of a habit or a field of information that another species can tap into uh, without ever knowing anything about that entity. I don't know if that makes any sense. But it's a very speculative idea. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, truthfully, there's not a lot of evidence for this from biology. I, I kind of like it as a, as a speculative idea, but there's no real data to really support it from what can, I know. I yeah, unless it? you know. Like yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you may, is this on? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, first of all, you may know that they took down a TED talk that Sheldrake gave because he was seen as anti-scientific, because it was, it was a systematic critique of scientific materialism. Um, and it's, it's on YouTube, though, you can find it. Um, but the thing is, uh, I would say uh, I'm actually somewhat sympathetic uh, to Sheldrake, sort of in the spirit you are. Um, and he is kind of one way of fleshing out panpsychism, actually. Okay, so I think that would be a fair thing to say about his view. If you want to get a sense of how you would have to get the science working right to come up with a sort of full-blown universal panpsychist theory, given you know one that tries to you know do justice to uh, 
quantum mechanics and lots of other things. Um, Sheldrake's view is something one could look at, right? But it is speculative, but it seems to me, yeah, I mean, I, I would take it seriously. It's something worth looking at. Yeah. He calls himself a panentheist. Uh huh, right, on, okay. On YouTube. Yeah. So, so the follow up question then to that would be um, I don't know if Sheldrake would be an applicable example, but how do you feel about um, hylomorphism in this particular instance concerning the consciousness, the, the inside story? And the reason why is because kind of going to what uh, Professor O'Connor had mentioned before, like you have the form and then you have like soul and you have like powers of the soul and stuff like that. So how does that, uh, when paired against uh, a more, I don't know if it would be strictly material because I think we're talking about both mind and matter. So from one direction, panpsychism and from another direction, emergence. emergence yeah. Or, where do you feel as though Hylomorphism either falls short in, I guess, contributing to the conversation, or where does it stand out from the others? We say hylomorphism, and and I think if you mean, because that's often seen as the kind of the hylozoism, which is what I was talking about, is kind of the, the the prototype of what is called the emergentist position now, right? So, and 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 what makes Sheldrake closer to a kind of panpsychic position is he doesn't have this kind of thing the gentleman was objecting to before about this kind of rigid causal structure that goes up and down. He doesn't have that, right? That would be a strength of his view from a panpsychist standpoint. But hylozoism typically was this from simple to complex kind of thing, right? So, so Sheldrake's definitely on the panpsychist side of that divide, I would say. If, we, if you mean hylozoism, if you no, mean I mean hylomorphism, yeah. well, that's, yeah, it's different. Yeah, he's not, <laughs> he can't be hylomorphism. No, no, no. So like, no. Subtle, no. Yeah. like that. The, pretty much like the ancient Greek and scholastic tradition, just like... No, that's not what he is. No, he's no, not, no, I'm not, I'm not saying yeah, he is. No, he's just asking where does it fit in, yeah. The, uh, the opposite view. No. <laughs> I, the reason why I brought it up is because if, like, let's say, um, morphic resonance starts to gain some traction, wouldn't that then be actively engaging in the physical world, but not necessarily material, mm -hmm. and wouldn't that be a manifestation of form? Like, yeah, 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 that's true, that's yeah. true. Oh yes, that's true. In in that sense. The type of hylomorphism. Yes, in that sense. In that in that general sense. In that general yeah, sense. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's. So know, in that sense, it's like where 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 else like where does hylomorphism fall short, particularly in this conversation? Where where or what strengths? What stands out? Can't do how fields. does it differ from? Yeah, can't yeah. Do, that's right. You know. Yeah, no fields. There's no. I mean, if you if you take a you know sort of a modern quantum. You know, the thermodynamic field. Yeah, it, it really can't handle that. I, I, I see it as part of a kind of older, kind of metaphysical worldview that modern science has kind of superseded. That's my general view about hylomorphism. I didn't even realize we would enter into that. I would have thought that's one metaphysical view we wouldn't be talking about. We are now. It's good. Yeah. Um, I'll just say um, there, there's a little boomlet going on. Oh no! Uh, 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 a who are who are uh, you know serious? People who understand science, but they want to interpret certain things in terms of this framework. But it's very confusing because uh, the, um, it, it just like the term emergence. This term gets bandied about. You know, it, I mean, for those who aren't in the know, uh, you know, it goes all the way back to Aristotle, matter form. You yeah. know, this is the fundamental way to understand substances. Uh, so I went to a conference uh, in Canada a year ago. A bunch of hylomorphists giving talks. Um, very good philosophers. Uh, and at, near the end, someone said, "You know, you know, it, it seems like we're, we're talking about different stuff. Can, can we?" Can you try to identify what's, what's the, what are the necessary conditions on hylomorphism to so the speaker, very eminent philosopher, I won't say who, uh, gave, gave a set of conditions and then someone thought about it and they said, so Aristotle was not a hylomorphist. Uh -oh. <laughs> and everyone laughed because yes, it was true that by the Christina criteria and, and so it, it just brought out no one really knew what, what was going on with, this, yeah. with this, the use of this Not notion. Starter. But there is, there, is a, there is an active discussion, people thinking there's something to this notion of a unity that in some sense, they, you know, it's a question that I was uh, given by someone, um, that in some sense the underlying matter is, is, is taken up into this unity so that it, it kind of loses its individuality in the process. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of core idea I, I, I associate with my Anyways, it's not my, my view, but there are some people who are, who are uh, actually thinking hard about that and think it's, they, they see it as, as preferable to uh, 
these alternatives that we've been broaching. Thanks. Afterwards, we could, there are three science examples, so afterwards yeah. we can talk about this. Yeah. Do you have a question here? Uh, yeah. Professor Caputo, uh, regarding your remarks uh, concerning the end of reality, right down to Olivia, uh, in the case of classical cybernetics, one could make the case that one of the sources of the tension that lead towards the collapse of cybernetics was this uh, situation between uh, Nobel Wiener thinking that entropy is true, seeing uh, life as portions of hope, indeed seeing machines as pockets of will, as opposed to Ross Ashby, William Ross Ashby, the British uh, psychiatrist engineer, who used to see the opposite, negative entropy as the necessary uh, outcome of things. Uh, for him, from chaos, order had to happen, so life was something inevitable. Eventually, that gets picked by uh, 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 Isabel Stengers and, and Ilya Prigovine in this book, Order of Chaos. And for a while, some would say that maybe that was going to change the core of physics away from materialism into organization. What happened with that? Because from what you said, the consensus is that it is entropy what would prevail, as opposed to negative entropy, entropy uh, order coming out of chaos. So, uh, yeah. what, what, what happened there? I'll let Jack do the future of the universe, yeah, but the okay. interview question is, um, is an easy one in science. Whenever you have the building of more complex systems, like a human being or a motor, you burn, you create more disorder than order. Mm -hmm. So entropy does work, it does win in the end. There's some complexities, but there's no model where a life form or refrigerator could work and create more order overall. Even the, the behavior of crystals, which was the source of uh, beer, uh, crystals. 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 No, no, no. Because if you have to chill a substance, then that's uh, use of energy. So no matter what we do, like this conference creates more disorder in the end. I hope you're not no kidding. <laughs> I want to talk about the end of the universe. I love, uh, that's your topic for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I simply introduced this idea because it's out there and it's oh, yeah. well received. And I, I say, I just ask, well, so what happens to our notions of omega or growing unity, etc.? Uh, with that. I mean, I'm just, I didn't come up with the idea. I don't advocate the idea. I, I just try to, I have a subscription to Scientific American. <laughs> <laughs> my, my goal there is to understand the table of contents. Okay. <laughs> so, so let me just add one more thing, because I forgot to add this okay. at the end of my thing. I, I wouldn't, going back to Maynard's question, I wouldn't, I mean, if that were to be the case, if that just proves to be the case, period, without saying, as Tim is saying, that God will just step in and stop it, prevent it. I wouldn't say that that um, spells the end of meaning. Hmm. Uh, because I think that mortality is the condition, possibility, for the, the value and the urgency of life. Hmm. And Next. the what, what would happen if, if there was no life in the universe for you know, like, like Sean Carroll says, that the early, early, the early uh, history of the universe is very interesting and it gets us up to the point of life and, and, and intelligence. But the rest of the history of the universe uh, is going to be very boring. It's just going to be... I, I would say, well, then what that does is make this moment, yeah. this life of ours, this uh, buzzing, blooming confusion William James describes, hmm. all the more precious. It would make life like two, my, my image is, two lovers in the night clinging to each other, knowing that in the morning they must part. Mm -hmm. I think it gives life depth. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to read, you may not like this, okay. but it's a way to read the O Navarro, the without why, sans pourquoi, 
motif of the, of the uh, Rhineland mystics. But life, if you ask life, why do you live? My Strathcart says, life will only answer, because I live because I live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is its own thing. It is its own value, it's its own urgency, its own beauty, its own truth. But it's finite. And, and that, in some ways, makes it all the more precious. So I don't think the, the notion of an open universe, I don't think that spells the end of me. I kind of look at it like breakfast, actually. You know, <laughs> Whoa. You have to crack a few eggs to, <laughs> you have to crack an egg, right? To make scrambled eggs to eat. In other words, there's a death of an egg, so to speak, uh, for the life of... So there, I think we haven't uh, encountered... So entropy, right, right uh, is, is what it's about. In other words, life functions on the breaking down of things in order to build up something that is nutritious, uh, that is uh, nutritive, generative. Uh, so there's a, so we haven't even talked about the role of death in this whole process <laughs> of mind and emergence, but that's okay. Okay, over here, how many, what, what are we on? Two, a few more questions and we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Well, maybe to, to say on this topic of death. <laughs> 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 Not to bring a dark cloud into this bright insights that you've had. <laughs> but, but the hope is like, what's a takeaway in a sense, too? And so I guess, what would what the role of, of sin and suffering be in all of this? I mean, we've had these ideas of like, we're looking toward ever greater unity, we're building community, we're looking for these ever greater levels of consciousness, but then I guess this goes back to some of the free choice uh, dialogue we're having before too, but it's like, are there things we can do to build up consciousness, and does that involve even suffering, or there are there things that we can engage in and choose to do that actually tears us down, and tears down community and leads us to further breakdown of, of consciousness and the universe, and I, and I guess from the Christian perspective, is that sin, and is that, is that a death? Or is that or like that? And so it's especially directed to you and how you were kind of talking about this growing and emergence, but it's um, as a whole, it's like what about what's our choice here that can we choose to build up or can we choose to turn down? Right. So, you know, I guess the question of sin, I mean, from a Teoretic perspective, Teoretic would say that this is an unfinished universe, right? So there is a, a certain amount of um, a breakdown. There is resistance, certainly on the human level, to to in a sense, this, uh, how would I might say, this allure of the whole, the whole that's within, that is, in a sense, seeking to become conscious in us, to become more whole. So I would say sin is the resistance to becoming whole. Sin is the resistance to the deep relationality that we find ourselves in, uh, rather than a fallen universe, you know, and therefore, you might say, the rejection of. Uh, we can say sin is the rejection of the call to community, if we want to put it that way. Uh, in the sense that if, there, if wholeness is at the heart, if, if Omega really is, if there's something that is mindful or conscious love that's uh, empowering this whole process of life, uh, then we might see sin as um, sort of that rejection of that power. But Tarek would also say the, the flip side of sin is creative effort. Like, in a sense, I do think that there's something about breakdown that causes us to look in new ways, to ask new questions, to get up again. Because there is something about life that continues to press on to more life, uh, despite the rejections, the resistances, and the failures. So, um, yeah, I think uh, we're in the mystery here of an unfinished universe as well. Uh, Greg? Well, first, thank you all for an amazing series of talks. Uh, thank you, Jack, for calling the conference and universe a question. Uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> In the same sentence. No less. <laughs> a question for I think Steve crazy. and Ilya. Um, you know, what I heard you both saying, interestingly enough, is that matter is not a ladder for mind to be climbed and then thrown away. That matter is something preserved, but also transformed. Yeah. Steve, when we talked before your talk, uh, in terms of Gnosticism, yeah. which of course is a suspicion, if not an outright denial yeah. of flesh. Sister, you talk about uh, the same thing from the standpoint of incarnation, the divinization of the mm -hmm. flesh. Logos becomes Sar Sars. That's an interesting tension. There seems to be something true about both of those, and I hope you could address that. You want me to start? Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, because as, uh, as Yuli was, t was talking, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, the way I was presenting the panpsychist picture, right, is that in some sense, matter is the fallen state of mind, you might say, right? And so then there is this kind of whatever transformation, getting beyond the limitations of mind to this kind of awakening position, right? This is kind of the general movement we're talking about. And as I was talking to you before the talk, especially when we think about this in the, in the context of transhumanism and these more radical kind of movements to break away from the status quo, from tradition and stuff like that, right? This was understood often in very striking, almost violent terms, right? Where in a sense, uh, current forms of material embodiment are the enemy because they're holding back spiritualization, okay? And I think you can connect that historically and I think this is where a lot of my remarks about the role of technology in somehow awakening the spirit more, right, is seeing that in some sense, one of the things that happens over time is that our matter, our material embodiment in a certain sense becomes more efficient as a displayer of the spirit, you might say, right? And people don't like to use the word efficiency very much, but you might talk about optimization or something like that. What, yeah, and, and yeah, so you start getting a more Leibniz kind of tip on these things. Um, and, and I do think that is kind of part of what the, the picture looks like, right? And, it's a, and, and I think the interesting, pic, the interesting question, and this is where we start to get into some very difficult theological territory, as if there wasn't already from the standpoint of the kinds of things I'm saying, um, <laughs> ab about uh, exactly what is the role of the divine other than being some kind of self-realization of what is initially a material reality. Right? Um, and, and so for those of you familiar with the history of Christianity, something like Pelagianism, right? Where there's a sense in which human beings can sort of do it, they can bootstrap themselves up to godhood, right? And we can have the heaven on earth and all of that kind of thing. And I do think that that is in fact one way in which this kind of view has been interpreted, right? So, so the idea of there being this kind of, uh, from Ilya's standpoint, this is where Teilhard gets kind of interesting because there is still a, a God that's beyond, right? A God that's calling us, as the gentleman was saying earlier, right? That, and, and so there is, still, there is still some kind of spirituality that is independent of this process that we're going through, right? That's, and, you know, and so that attractive force, right, then becomes really quite important, as it were, to keep the God side of this alive. Right? Because otherwise it looks like a kind of materialistic vision is colonizing the divine. That's a, you know, and I think that's one reason why, for example, you know, theologians and religious people generally shy away very much from anything that looks like a kind of transhumanism. Right? Uh, so I guess, yeah, so, so, so I actually do see the similarity, and of course it was alluded to that you know, I, ha I have a background having studied Teilhard de Chardin. I find actually that view kind of compelling, actually, in its own way. But, but uh, uh, so, so I'm, I'm resonant to this kind of, these kinds of problems. I don't, I don't have a very clear answer to it, but it is one. And so I look with some interest to your position. I think you have some, you know, especially this idea of the attraction and the call as was brought out earlier. Mm -hmm. I think there, there's something that needs to be addressed there. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just maybe add to that, what Steve was saying. Um, again, it's, it's and if I could use the word the mystery of God here, in other words, I think God cannot be reduced to just simply a causal agent, even as prime causal agent, or just simply as goal, as a telos. That there's something about the godness of God that is actually, that's almost dependent on, if I can use that word, on materiality. Uh, now that's strange to say that, and by that I don't mean a Pelagianism, like we get, like Steve was saying, I mean, we don't get just empowered to save ourselves type thing. There's something about God here that's really, uh, if I can put it maybe in this language, the godness of God precisely is in the materiality of matter itself. And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the irreducible dialectic from my perspective. That is the mystery. And I, I don't think we can reduce that mystery to one position or another. And there's something, I mean, this is where I think the mystics draw us into this depth of matter, right? And when we look at Angela and some of the women mystics here, you know, that, that the poor, that, I use the language porousness of matter, you know, this opening of matter to being truly matter is to be is becoming conscious of, of uh, you know, of otherness at the heart of thisness, so to speak. Again, the language is, gets a little fuzzy here, but um, I think from an incarn incarnational perspective, uh, what we're saying, and I take the incarnation as central here, not just something that God does, you know, to save a fallen world, that this is what God is, that the self-emptying is, is the very Godness of God, and therefore matter then is, in a sense, revealed in, in, um, 
in its own beingness as something that's, you might say, essential and, and integral to the godness of God, who overflows that matter, right? Who's never contained by anything material or anything that's finite. Uh, everything that's finite, in a sense, is over overflowing in its beingness. And, and that's why I do think becoming is at the heart of it as well. So I don't know if that helps, but... Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, Carl, you'll have the last question. Cool. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, both of my questions are just anticipated by the previous two questions. So okay. I dropped my questions like before the microphone. Um, okay. So I uh, have to kind of think on the fly now. Um, I mean, one thing I want to ask, maybe particularly of uh, so the whole panel to get kind of illicit theological um, and philosophical intuitions on this question is where the resources to think um, what both evil and redemption from evil would come from in broadly holistic and emergentist pictures. So we sort of touched on these questions in the last two, this kind of sort of only artfully reformulating things that were just asked. But um, uh, if they say just the whole, if God somehow becomes with the whole or is in the whole, then there's a kind of deep metaphysical perplexity about why things would go awry or how they would go awry. Sort of whence the fallen condition of the tree began. He seems to want to something fallen about the starting point. Where would that come from in a broadly sort of holistic picture of divine world, say, collectivity? Um, it seems you could say perhaps this fall that happens in within God, and that's the troublesome theologically. Um, then the, with respect to emergentism, there's making a sort of worry about um, what, like, well, a worry about this sort of Pelagianism as a word if. If God emerges somehow with the whole, so the whole's not given, but God somehow emerges with the whole, then there's a sense in which it's kind of impotence to God there. So, um, just, uh, right, if, if somehow God is involved in the process, then he can't be the one who would rescue us if the process goes by. Right? Now, maybe it's in Jack kind of wants to endorse that position, so it is a certain sort of weakness to God that makes, gives a kind of poignancy to a theological question. But I want to ask that just. Now, not because it's a sharpened problem, no one's asked before, it's not true, but just to elicit more um, intuition from folks here. Yeah. We'll have him begin. Hey, can, can I begin? Because yeah. I, I can be brief. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tough act to follow. Um, well, I just. God, it is. It, it's a very difficult. Very difficult. It is one. I, you're right. I, I, actually, I actually think that there's something. See, one of the things that people may not be aware, or maybe they are aware of, is actually how integral the idea of original sin was in, in the origin of modern science. I mean, Peter Harrison, who is a science religion scholar, right, has written a book on this called The Fall of Man and the, and the Rise, of modern, uh, Rise of Science, okay? Um, and uh, what was very important there, uh, and, and maybe this begins to address your question, is um, the conception of, of uh, the fallenness of, 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 of humanity is actually very closely associated in the, uh, in the Reformation with the revival of St. Augustine's view on the matter, because St. Augustine was in fact the one who really, see one of the reasons why Pelagianism got so much mileage was because the doctrine of original sin wasn't really that strongly pushed in the early part of the church, right? I mean, and so, but Augustine's views about these matters, along with his views about Genesis and a lot of other things, uh, get revived in the Protestant Reformation, okay? And so the key notion here about fallenness is deprived of God. Right, so this idea of the incompleteness, right, the incompleteness of the universe, right, the lack of wholeness, right, that is the where that is kind of how the fallenness is, is manifested in the first instance, right, and so insofar as we live in a universe where we don't quite understand how it all fits together, right, where we kind of only experience it in a very particular and kind of abject way, right, where we we don't feel we're part of the story, as it were, we're just a victim of it. Right? We're in a fallen state, right? And in that sense, we can be buffeted around like ordinary pieces of matter, like the way ordinary animals and other things are. And the idea is to get beyond that, right? To get beyond that fallen state and become more attached, as it were, and more part of the holistic process of the world. And in the history, in, in the, you know, during the Reformation, people started looking at things like the experimental method, what we call the scientific method, as a way of doing this as a way of engaging in the co-creation, co-production, co-responsibility for the disposition of the world in a very kind of active, agential way that in many respects, you know, started as it were, we start in, in inhabiting our implicit godhood from which we've been de de 
you know, uh, denied by our fallen status. So you start getting this kind of self-conception coming along, and one of the ways it gets manifested, let's say in somebody like Newton, right, is the idea that you can adopt God's point of view. Right? That's, I mean, that, that kind of idea of being able to think that you can actually have, you know, now everybody challenges this these days and, 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 and so forth, but, the, but that was a very important moment in the history of science, the idea that human being, right, Newton in particular, could actually, at least in principle, occupy, right, because that would be one way of demonstrating, you know, of, of showing that in fact, and insofar as that actually leads you to have a more efficacious understanding of the world, it enables you to improve your standard of living and all the rest of it, you start getting at least indirect evidence, right, so you don't want to be totally Pelagian about this, but at the same time, you feel you're onto something. And so, of course, then you start getting this kind of strong connection, actually, very positive connection between science and theology that goes into the late 19th century. And Darwin, of course, changes all that, and a lot of other things change that as well. But the point is, that's kind of the trajectory, you know, from the standpoint of the history of science, there is that story to be told in which the initial, you know, the sense, a strong sense of a fallen humanity that then can nevertheless recover in some way, possibly, is, is a story. So original sin is actually, you know, the Augustinian conception of original sin in particular plays a role in this. Okay, I'm not saying this is a foolproof answer to what you're saying, but in terms of motivating how one might be inclined to, because look, if you're in a fallen state, why not just think, I'm in a fallen state, I can't do anything about it. You're not just saying this because you're at Villanova, right? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder if I could play with what Ilya did and challenge a traditional notion, but directly address your question. If God becomes material, empties God's self into the material world, what if the steps of re-emergence were not anything like the traditional doctrines, I'm going to pretend I'm not at Villanova, um, but um, something radically different. What if we can't find sin at the beginning? What if we can't find a nature red in tooth and claw as sinful, but what if there's actually an emergence of new capacities and complexities which in their ability to function are the positive? See? Oh, there you go. I've got a friend in the audience. One out of 200. Um, and so that you say, you know, for the animal to eat the animal, there's nothing sinful there. The Christian tradition was wrong. There's no primordial good, just Ilya's story. And then you get up to beings that have some chance to act in a more spontaneous way. We know, for instance, dogs and wolves in play behavior exercise spontaneity. And on up to the complexity, now skip all the steps, human beings have the capacity to be outside of ourselves, looking at ourselves, and Tim and I would argue in slightly different ways, a kind of freedom. So there is a, there is a possibility, is, is it not really good? There is a possibility of thinking about sin only though in the sense of acting according to what's possible to us. I'm planning, trying to hand off to Jack here in a like, low and outside pitch. <laughs> <laughs> through the individual human, and then Georg might say to groups of humans, through societies, through historical epochs, through civilizations, that we manifest these possibilities in ways that are more life-producing or more destructive of life. And what if sin has to do with that range of possible behaviors, whether they act toward what, harmony, community, the God who took God's self into the material, so stages rather than sinful acts and non-acts? I could just maybe paraphrase on that really quick, but I'll hand I mean, what if we were to conceive of evil itself as the failure to, what, what if we conceive it as stripping matter of mind and failing to love matter? In other words, when we reduce matter to matter, stripped of anything else, uh, and therefore matter becomes just inner, right? Be matter just becomes anything we want to do with it, and we can reject it, we can toss it apart. And so that's why I do think this question of mind uh, and love play not just uh, you know, an additional role, but an essential role into how we conceive matter. Uh, Jack, you have last word. Yeah. I, I'm very close to what Phil, Phil was saying. I, I mean, I, in Schillingian terms, I think the, uh, the, the ground of being is, uh, you know, is, is dark. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's got 
multiple sides. And we emerge from it as finite things, fragile, ambiguous. Uh, the, the myth of the fall is not helpful. The new ways would be greatly. Sorry, guy. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> that, that's, that's, Augustine told a story based on a misinterpretation of hey, the you know Latin translation. You guys can argue over dinner. <laughs> and I, I think so. I think it has to do with what, what Phil was saying: the the ambiguity, the 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 ambience. Mm the open-endedness of a particular form of life that has emerged in us allows mutations of both the felicitous and the infelicitous sort. And if you try to take away the one, you'll take away the other. If you try to pull the, pull the, uh, the string of, of, of the dark side, of the, of the, of the ambience, then you'll take away the creativity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is this. The notion, if you have a notion of a personal God, you'll never get out, you'll never solve this problem. Right. If God is a personal, intimate, omniscient, omnibenevolent, personal agent, you're cooked. You're cooked. You're not going to be able to solve the problem. That's a happy note to end this conference. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion. Consciousness, nature, and transcendence. I don't know if we've answered any anything really here, but we certainly have put forth a lot of ideas. And you know, since our task is to go forth, to read, to continue, to think, to ponder, uh, in a sense, this, in my view, the great mystery of life, uh, and to respond, you might say, with integrity and honesty. So thank you for coming and being part of this conference. I want to thank again our speakers, Tim, Steve, Phil, and Jack. And again, a big thanks to Greg Hansel for pulling this all together. And thanks. Have a good day.